Welcome to the show, friends, neighbors, chums, cronies. Uh, on this blessed Ash Wednesday, uh, today we'll we'll run down and review the Democratic debate, which happened last night. And in many ways, and for many reasons, it was an embarrassment, as it always is for the Democratic Party. Uh, but but that you know, fortunately makes it hilarious for everybody else. Hilarious until you remember that these people want to control the country, and then it becomes sad. So it's a you know embarrassing, hilarious, sad. It's kind of a roller coaster emotional journey when you watch these debates. Also, speaking of the Democratic Party uh, and embarrassments, they yesterday blocked a bill that would have prevented clinics and hospitals from leaving babies born after botched abortions to die. The, the bill would have guaranteed those, those born children at least basic medical care. Well, Democrats blocked that and said, no, it's better to just let the children die. So we have to talk about that as the Democratic Party, again, uh, reveals itself to be the party of evil. Uh, we'll discuss that. Also, five other news headlines worth knowing about. Plus, today I have the distinct honor of canceling The New Yorker. I'm going to officially cancel The New Yorker, and I'll explain why. First, uh, a reminder that my book, Church of Cowards, officially went on sale yesterday. You could get it now. The response to the book so far has been has been very encouraging, and I, I appreciate everyone who's bought the book so far and reached out to me about it. Um, if I were to sum up the point of, of the book in, in, in three sentences or less, well, I guess the point is, is really just right there in the title. This is about a wake-up call to complacent Christians. But really, what I'm uh, calling for in the book is for the revival of Christianity's fighting spirit, because ours is a warrior faith, or at least that's what it's supposed to be. That's what it has been historically. That's our, that's our heritage. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe we are not called to a physical fight, at least in this re region of the world these days, but we are called to a spiritual fight, a moral fight. We can't shrink away from that. And we have been, though, uh, for many decades now. And that's why I wrote the book. And um, that was more than three sentences, I suppose. But you can go to Amazon and buy it now. So please do that. All right. Debate last night. Um, I suppose on this day of repentance, it makes sense to start with the Democratic debate. Uh, as watching it, for me, was an act of, of penance. Overall impressions right out of the gate. A, a rather catastrophic night for the Democratic Party. Let's begin with the optics. Okay, Let, let's think about this. This is a, a debate for the Democratic nomination. And that is supposed to be, we're told, the progressive party, the enlightened party, the party of inclusion, the party of, of diversity. Well, who was on stage last night? Two billionaires, two billionaires, not just one, two in the Democratic debate, uh, three millionaires, three men over 70, only one person under 50, all white people, no minorities. That was the debate. So old white folks, almost exclusively. That's, uh, and mostly men. So th that's what the Democratic Party has to offer. Th their field is, uh, at this point, what they accuse the Republican Party of being. That's exactly what they are. Other impressions, first of all, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, uh, it, it concerns me that every time I watch one of these debates, or I, I, I watch them giving a, a speech for as long as I can tolerate it, what, 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 it, it seems clear to me that they are not capable of saying anything or answering any question um, without screaming. Everything they say, have you noticed that? Everything they say, they're screaming. I'm not sure I've ever heard either one of them say anything in a normal inside voice. So I was imagining last night, like, how it must sound when when Biden goes to, like, order a, a pizza at Pizza Hut. You know, the guy says, hi, welcome to Pizza Hut. Uh, can I take your order? Listen, the fact of the matter is that I need a pepperoni pizza. Why are you screaming? Let's be clear about this. I'm serious. Let's be clear. Barack and I had pizza every night. I invented pizza. I passed the legislation that makes it possible for you people to eat pizza. I'm serious. That's, that's Joe Biden's answer to every single question. Let's be clear. I'm serious. Barack, listen, and the fact of the matter. That's every, it's, just a, it's a combination of those words, screamed. Uh, and of course, in Bernie's case, not only does he scream every answer, but he's also incapable of uttering a sentence that doesn't include the word billionaire. Uh, now, he, now, he used to have a lot more range in his vocabulary because he used to talk about millionaires and billionaires. 
So he used to have two words he could say. But then he became a millionaire, and so he doesn't want to rail against millionaires anymore because he is one. Uh, and, and so now it's just billion. Now he's, now he's limited to just one word. His method of arguing is to accuse anyone who disagrees with him of being a billionaire, which is very similar to the general sort of left-wing method of arguing where normally they accuse anyone who disagrees with them of being a Nazi. Um, now, Bernie's not, you know, not opposed to, to, to using that method, but he prefers it. for him to be a billionaire is worse than being a Nazi. So his comeback to everything always is, oh yeah, did, did the billionaires pay you to say that? And then he waits for the applause. Although last night it was interesting that the audience seemed to be stacked against him. So every time he went for the billionaire uh, comeback, the billionaire diss, it, it, got, it solicited uh, boos in the audience, which was interesting. But probably my favorite thing from Bernie last night um, was when he attempted to reach out to minority communities by promising to help them sell drugs. And that really did happen. That's, that's something that he really did. And we'll play that clip for you in just a moment. But first, let's check in with our uh, good friends over at Rock Auto. You know, uh, the thing that always impresses me about rockauto.com when I go to their website, which I go frequently for, for our various car problems, which we unfortunately frequently have, uh, is just the selection that they, that they have there. They have seemingly everything you could possibly need. And it's extremely easy to navigate. You know, chain stores, the thing about the chain stores, you go there, they have different price tiers for professional mechanics and do-it-yourselfers. They're going to decide, you know, based on your experience level, how much they're going to charge you. Well, rockauto.com doesn't do that. Same price for everyone. It doesn't even require a membership or, or, or account or anything to log in. You just go there, you get what you need. Rockauto.com always offers the lowest prices possible rather than changing price tiers based on what the market will bear. Uh, and so they're just going to give you low prices, great selection, and that's it. That's what you're getting. The rockauto.com catalog is unique, remarkably easy to navigate. Uh, rockauto.com has everything from engine control modules and brake parts to tail lamps and motor oil and uh, even new carpet, whatever you could possibly need. They've got it there. So go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. That's rockauto.com. Write Walsh in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So that they know that uh, I sent you. All right, so Bernie Sanders uh, was, was trying to appeal to minority communities, and, and uh, his attempt to appeal to them was by promising that he would help them sell drugs. L listen to this. And I'll tell you what else we're going to do. We're going to provide help to the African-American, Latino, Native American community to start businesses to sell legal marijuana rather than let a few corporations control the legalized marijuana market. Yes, that is, that's Bernie's uh, minority outreach. He's going he's gonna to let them sell their drugs. Now, okay, I know the Democrats get the advantage of a double standard on racial issues and on all other issues, of course. But how is that not the most racist thing that any candidate has said through this entire election cycle and beyond? That's when when he thinks of of helping you know young uh, black people and 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 Hispanics that uh, Asian Americans. You know, th this is what this is what comes to mind. This would be like if he said he wanted to help the Irish American community. He has a great plan for helping them, and and it is he's going to offer half off discounts on all whiskey. That's his plan to reach out to Irish Americans, which. As an Irish American, I would very much appreciate that, especially as I'm, you know, we're trying to stock up all the necessary provisions for the coronavirus. And it's very important, by the way, that you're prepared for that and you have all the whiskey you're going to need to get through it in case there is any disruptions in the, in the supply chain of, of whiskey or if you can't get to the store. But uh, so I would appreciate that. But still, I mean, it's, it, we can't deny it's pretty demeaning. But of course, the gaffe that everyone is talking about tonight is, uh, or today is, is Biden making a rather startling claim about gun violence. Listen to this. But my friend and my right and others have, in fact, also given to the gun manufacturers absolute immunity. Imagine if I stood here and said we give immunity to drug companies. We give immunity to tobacco companies. That has caused carnage on our streets. 150 million people have been killed since 2007 when Bernie voted to exempt the gun manufacturers from liability. More than all the wars 
including Vietnam, from that point on. Carnage on our street, and I want to tell you, if I'm elected and I'm coming for you, and gun manufacturers, I'm going to take you on, and I'm going to beat you. 150 million people have died from gun violence in the past 13 years. That was the claim. 150 million people. That's, that's half of the U.S. population. So what I learned last night is that half of the U.S. population is currently dead from gun violence, which I guess the, the bright side of that, I mean, if there can be a bright side to 150 million people dying, the bright side is that now fewer people will die from climate change. So when climate change kills us all in 10 years or nine years or whatever it is, uh, now there's just the devastation will in some ways be lessened by the fact that most of us will have already died from being shot. So, I mean, I, look, I'm trying to find a silver lining around that cloud, uh, and that's the best I could do. Now, uh, Elizabeth Warren, here's something that stood out to me. Uh, she she launched into an attack on Bloomberg, and this seems to be her main focus is attacking Bloomberg for some reason, even though Bloomberg hasn't won, hasn't even contested, it hasn't even been in the contest yet for any of the, any of the primaries up to this point. Um, but she's very focused on Bloomberg. But there, there's something about this this moment that really stood out to me. Watch watch this. You know, this is personal for me. When I was 21 years old, I got my first job as a special education teacher. I loved that job. And by the end of the first year, I was visibly pregnant. The principal wished me luck and gave my job to someone else. Pregnancy discrimination, you bet. But I was 21 years old, I didn't have a union to protect me, and I didn't have any federal law on my side. So I packed up my stuff and I went home. At least I didn't have a boss who said to me, kill it. The way that I Mayor Bloomberg never alleged said to that. have said okay. to one of oh, his on. pregnant employees. Okay, now, of course, the story she's telling there about pregnancy discrimination is bogus. Of course. It's been debunked, like almost everything else she says. She's a pathological liar. She can't help herself. She lies. Uh, it's a compulsion. She can't, she can't stop herself from doing it. She lies like she breathes. But that's not, that's not the part that was interesting to me. At the end of the clip there, she accuses Bloomberg of telling a pregnant mother to kill it, being the baby. Now, I don't know if Bloomberg said that or not. He denies it. Who knows? It sounds a little far-fetched, but, but maybe he said it. That's not the point. Here's my question. Why does she have a problem, Warren that is, with somebody suggesting that a woman kill her baby? Warren is radically pro-abortion. In fact, radically pro-infanticide, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. From her perspective, the baby is not human, has no right to life, has no dignity, has no moral value, has no value of any kind. Why shouldn't Bloomberg say kill it? What's the problem? What exactly is the issue? I mean, you know, I know what the problem is, of course. Hopefully you know what the problem is. But then again, I'm against killing babies in general. So, of course, I can be against that. About, against what he said, allegedly. But Warren is in favor of it. Not just in favor of it, but she believes that killing babies is, not just that it's okay, but that it's a liberating act. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expression of a woman's autonomy and independence. So all Bloomberg was really suggesting is that, a, is that this woman express her autonomy and independence. He didn't say kill it, he said express your autonomy. It was empowering. It was, a, it was an empowering encouragement to this woman um, not to be enslaved by the, the subhuman parasite in her body. From Warren's perspective, that's what it was. See, but it's, it's hard to be consistent, to be intellectually consistent when you're pro-abortion because it means that you have no basis, no reason to get upset about something like what Bloomberg is alleged to have said. But at the same time, you know that what he said, allegedly, is cruel and awful. So you want to be against it. You want to be outraged by it, but you can't be. Because to be outraged by it is to admit that killing babies is a moral outrage, which is exactly what you cannot admit. Uh, speaking of morally outrageous... Bernie Sanders last night was again stumbling and, and bumbling around, trying to justify all the, the very nice and admiring things that he said about 
communist regimes like the one in Cuba uh, or the one that was in uh, uh, communist or Soviet Russia. So I want to play a clip for you, uh, not from last night, but from the night before at a town hall on CNN, where he's again going into the wonders of, of communist governments. Uh, and then we'll talk about it. Watch this. The response was when Fidel Castro first came to power, which was when? 59? Is that sound right? 59, 60. Okay. You know what he did? He initiated a major literacy program. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in Cuba at that point who were literate. And he formed the Literacy Brigade. You may re read that. He went out and they helped people learn to read and write. You know what? I think te teaching people to read and write is a good thing. I have been extremely consistent and critical of all authoritarian regimes all over the world, including Cuba, including Nicaragua, including Saudi Arabia, including China, including Russia. I happen to believe in democracy, not authoritarianism. But, you know, you can't say China is another example. All right. China is an authoritarian country becoming more and more authoritarian. But can anyone deny? I mean, the facts are clear that they have taken more people out of extreme poverty than any country in history. Do I get criticized because I say that? That's the truth. So that is the fact. End of discussion. So end of discussion, he says. Not really. We will discuss what he said in a moment. But first, uh, checking in with ExpressVPN. You know, it, it seems to me that using the internet without a VPN, it's a bit like going to the bathroom without closing the door. Which, if, if you're like me and you, you live through most of your early 20s by yourself, and you got very used to doing that, but then once there's other people around, you can't do it anymore, it's, it's, you're exposing yourself. Why would you allow yourself to be exposed in that way? Uh, well, that's what it's like when you use the internet without a VPN. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit, whether it's Comcast or Verizon, whoever you use? They know everything about you, basically. They know all of your internet activity. And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. So you're being exploited as well as exposed and all of your private information is out there. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. ExpressVPN works on everything, phones, laptops, routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected, even if they don't have ExpressVPN. Best part is using ExpressVPN is in, is easy as uh, as closing the bathroom door. It's just it's that simple. So if you're like me and you believe that your online activity is your business, you should have that privacy. Secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com/walsh today. Use my exclusive link. That's e x p r e s s v p n dot com slash walsh. You get an extra three months for free if you use that URL. That's expressvpn.com slash Walsh. Okay, um, so Bernie extolling the virtues of communist regimes. First of all, those literacy programs, so-called, were really re-education programs. But even if Castro did help people be more literate, he also locked political dissidents in prison. He executed people who opposed him. He starved his own people. It was tyranny. It was oppression. So saying, yeah, but literacy, it is no different. It's no different at all than saying, yeah, but they had good policies protecting animal rights in reference to Nazi, Nazi Germany, which in fact the Nazis did. They, they were very much into to animal welfare, not so much into human welfare, but they loved animals at least. But of course, making that argument would sound morally obtuse in the extreme. This is the same thing. Here's what I would recommend, and I'm going to talk more about this uh, tomorrow because I want, I want to move on from politics right now, but, but tomorrow or the next day, I want to, we'll get more into this. What I'll say for now is, um, I know I have a book out and I'm urging you to read it. Uh, so I don't want to give you too many things to read, but my book is not that long. So you, you can get through that. Once you do that, my next suggestion is to get a book that's a lot longer. Uh, it's called Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. It's three volumes. Each volume is probably about 900 pages or so. Start with the first volume, read that at least. This should be required reading for kids in high school. Uh, and it should be required reading for everybody. If you want to know what communism is, what it's really like, if you want to know what the real cost is for all the wonderful 
literacy programs and everything else, all the, all the supposedly good things that communism allegedly brings, then read this book. A book that, of course, was banned in Soviet Russia, so, so much for literacy. Um, the book is Solzhenitsyn's history of the Soviet labor camp system. He intertwines his own experience in it because he was sent to the labor camps. Uh, so it's his own story. It's sort of a memoir slash general history of, um, of, of uh, Soviet Russia and the labor camp system. And it's gripping, it's absorbing, it's fascinating, it's brutal to read. And it's important, especially now, as America threatens to elect a communist president. Um, by the way, do you know why Solzhenitsyn went to prison? Because he fought in World War II for the Soviets. He was Russian. And uh, Stalin had a system back then of, of sending many of the boys who, 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 and they were boys, a lot of them, young, you know, younger than 18, uh, who, who were off fighting the war. And, and, and these were the guys who had seen some of the, the most brutal and, and bloodiest, some of the worst fighting in the war. Um, after they'd gone through that uh, for the sake of their country, their thank you when they got home was many of them were shipped off to labor camps. And why is that? Because Stalin was, was worried that they'd been exposed to Western ideas. And so he felt threatened by that. And to play it safe, he just sent a lot of them off to the labor camps. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was sent off because he had written a letter while he was um, on the front, uh, written a couple of letters where he was vaguely critical of the government. And that was intercepted and seen. And, and he went to the labor camp system for that. I would just start reading that book. Um, and there's no way, I mean, there's no way you could get even halfway through it and still have any positive thoughts about communism. We'll talk more about this, uh, that this week, uh, cause there's a lot in that book that I think is, is very instructive. Uh, and it's a book that, you know, maybe, maybe Bernie Sanders should get around to reading at some point. All right, let's, uh, let's check in with some, some news. We'll go through five headlines here that are worth knowing about. Uh, number one, the CDC is now warning that an outbreak of the coronavirus in the U.S. is inevitable. And we should prepare for significant disruptions to our daily life. That's, that's the words they're using. We're told, quote, uh, it's not so much a question of if this will happen in this country anymore, but a question of when this will happen. Now, I've been a skeptic up until now. I've, I've seen the media hype up these epidemics many times. I've seen so much unnecessary panic over so many things that I thought this was another one of those things. It appears I may have been wrong. Uh, this is the time when, you know, the boy crying wolf, the boy's crying wolf, and maybe there actually is a wolf this time. Um, now, I still think there's no need to panic. I still think um, we should keep in mind that the death toll of this virus has a lot to do with the fact that it started in China, where their healthcare system is falling apart. I mean, their hospitals are literally falling apart, are in shambles. Um, so we're basing the, 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 the death toll on that, the mortality rate we're basing on that. And uh, so I think that's something we should keep in mind. It's also true, though, that the CDC doesn't generally say stuff like this for no reason. So Perhaps it would make sense to take some precautions. In fact, my, my wife last night, we were talking about this and uh, she started buying supplies. We, we both agreed that, you know, maybe you get, if, if the CDC is saying there may be some disruptions to your daily life, uh, maybe disruptions in the supply chain, there's, you know, if you're not able to get out of the house, if there's quarantines or something, that it makes sense to have some um, preservable food and, and stuff like that in the house. Uh, so my wife, my, my wife was buying a few things. She started buying freeze dried meats. And I, you know, I said to her, why, why can't we get regular meat and freeze it? And she said, because we have a, an extra freezer in the garage. And she said, well, if the power goes out. And I said, why would the coronavirus cause the power to go out? And she didn't really have a response for that, but that didn't dissuade her. So she uh, got all that. I guess we're now preparing for the end of human civilization as we know it. Which, for the record, I, I still insist that human civilization is not coming to an end over this. But uh, a little preparation is probably smart. Okay, number two. A video that's um, gone viral out of the hellscape known as San Francisco shows a black man stealing cans from and attempting to assault an Asian man while a group of people stand around laughing. And the guy filming cheers it on and says, I hate Asians. 
Uh, watch, watch this. Uh, what? Uh oh, he's scared. OG, crack his. You hear that? Get your. I hate Asians. Now I'm just looking forward to hearing from the um, only white people can be racist crowd on this one. I'm sure they can explain how what you just saw there is not racist. I'm, I'm sure they have a great explanation. It can't be because this is what we're told. It, oh, a, a black person cannot be racist by definition. So what you saw there, not racist. Somehow. Three, uh, yesterday, Michelle Janavs, who the media tells us is the hot pocket heiress, the heir to the hot pocket fortune, was sentenced to five months in, in jail for the college admission scandal. She apparently spent hundreds of thousands of dollars helping her daughters cheat on on tests, uh, defrauding colleges in other ways. I think she had one of her daughters in a fake, uh, somehow a fake, uh, fake volleyball scholarship or something like that uh, in order to get them into, into good schools. And now she's going to prison for it. Not really prison. I'm sure the place she's going will be more of a, more of a, a sleepaway camp than a prison. I think a better penalty, a harsher one, would be to force her to eat only Hot Pockets for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for, say, a year. If you can even survive that, because of course it's not technically edible. Uh, this isn't really, it's not a real food product. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's not food. Certainly the roof of her mouth would be destroyed by the end of it. With those gushes of molten cheese just scorching her mouth at every meal. Cruel and unusual punishment, I suppose. Number four, a conservative think tank has found uh, who they're calling the anti-Greta. You know, Greta Thunberg, of course, the 16-year-old climate alarmist. That's all over the media. Well, a conservative think tank went out and find, found their own blonde uh, teenage girl, but this one is a skeptic of climate change, and now they're sending her out to make the case against climate alarmism. She's a 19-year-old German named Naomi. So this is great. This is really great, right? Conservatives have been saying for months that we shouldn't listen to teenagers on science, that teens are not science experts, and we were right about that. Uh, you know, it's silly to use teenagers as, as mascots on an issue like this. And now what are we doing, I guess? We're turning around and finding our own teenage fake science expert. Here's an idea. Here's, here's a different option. Maybe we should consider this. Uh, maybe we could stop propping teenagers up as experts in anything. Maybe liberals could stop doing it. Conservatives can stop doing it. Because teenagers don't know anything. They're not experts in anything. They aren't authorities in anything. Um, and if you as an adult are turning to a teenager for wisdom or insight into any subject at all, especially science, that is a symptom of your own rather staggering mental deficiencies. I mean, if you have ever heard a, a teenager say something, particularly on the, in the issue, uh, you know, in the realm of science, and thought to yourself, wow, that's... I, I learned something today. I never thought of that before. Um, that tells you a lot more about you than it does about them. So maybe we could just stop doing this. Number five, ABC is now working on a Bachelor spinoff, this one for senior citizens. Um, the casting call on the website says, now casting seniors looking for love, are you entering your golden years and looking for romance? The producers of The Bachelor are looking for active and outgoing single men and women in their golden years for a new exciting dating show. I have to be honest with you, uh, I have never seen one second of The Bachelor or any of its variants. I have no idea what the show even is. I've always vaguely wondered what happens on it. Uh, I've never cared enough to investigate, so I guess women are competing to, to, to be the one who gets to marry a guy, a random guy. Is that what it is? Is the guy, is he rich or something? What's the, why is it a prize? Well, anyway, um, speaking of mental deficiencies, I, I don't see how anyone with an IQ over, say, 45 could watch a show like this. But then when you consider the high ratings these shows get, you know, that's a whole lot of sub-45 IQs out there. And these people can vote too. And um, if you can imagine, and that explains a lot about our, 
about the state of our republic. I have said many times, and I do believe, that I would be in favor of automatically disenfranchising anyone who has ever watched an entire episode of a show like The Bachelor. You lose your voting rights permanently. I would be totally in favor of that. If only a candidate would have the guts to suggest a policy of that sort. Um, but of course, no candidate would do that because every political candidate, they love the idea of dumb people voting because dumb people are a lot, a lot easier to, to manipulate. All right, um, so moving on. On Tuesday, Democrats in the U.S. Senate blocked a bill that uh, would have required clinics and hospitals to provide basic medical treatment to infants born alive after uh, botched abortions. Uh, Democrats tried to position the Born Alive Abortions Survivor Protection Act, which is what it was called, tried to position it as a, as a radical assault on the bodily autonomy of women, uh, an intrusion of the government into medical decisions, but it was nothing of the sort, of course. You can read the text of the bill. Despite the histrionics and the claims from people like Senator Gillibrand, who uh, went on CNN and said that the legislation would harm women, despite all that, all the act would have done is prohibit abortionists from leaving infant children to die after they're born after a, a failed abortion. There is no clump of cells dodge available here. The humans in question are infant children, born, fully developed, living, breathing, outside the womb. Democrats have now declared that even they aren't worthy of, of legal protections. Even they, apparently, have no moral value. Now, as always, the pro-infanticide infanticide Democrats have the full support of the media. So CNN, with no hint of irony, actually, in an article yesterday, called uh, babies born after abortions fetuses. I believe the phrase they used was, was a, a fetus that was born. That's a baby that survives an abortion. A fetus that was born. And they distinguish in the article... They distinguish the fetus that was born from a newborn baby. They're saying those are two different things. According to CNN, a newborn baby is a child that's born alive on purpose because the mother wants the child. And a fetus that was born is a, is a, is a child that was born accidentally uh, despite the wishes of the mother. So the humanity of the baby, even outside of the womb, depends entirely on the mother's desires. And this is what uh, pro-abortion people have been saying for a long time. They've been very explicit about it. If you ask them and you say, well, when does life begin? They'll say, life begins when the mother wants. The, the humanity of the child is relative to the mother's wishes and desires. And now we're being told that that logic extends even beyond the womb. Now, it it's, it's, was argued... Um, that this bill was unnecessary because babies so rarely manage to survive abortion, so it's just an unnecessary bill. We don't need to do this. Well, if that's true, then first of all, why oppose it? And why claim that it's an attack on women's rights? So you can't have it both ways. Either it's an unnecessary, redundant bill, or it's, uh, it's a, a terrible assault on, on, on the, the, the rights of women, or neither of those things. Of course, that, it's neither of those. But it can't be both of those things. And in any case, it, it, the claim is not true. Um, this does happen. Hundreds of children have died after surviving abortion attempts. And that's, those are just the ones we know about. Because there are only a few states that, that report that kind of information. Um, and even there, you're, you're relying on the abortion clinics to honestly report what happened. So just based on the very limited sample that we know about, it's clear that it has happened hundreds of times. So those are hundreds of infant children who were left to die and could have been saved. The current law does not protect those babies. Now, the current law does allegedly uh, prevent abortionists from actively killing the babies who are born after a botched abortion. Although we know that even that happens, Kermit Gosnell did it for decades, killed hundreds of babies directly. Uh, and was able to do it for decades in the middle of an Amer a major American city without being stopped. But allegedly the, the law stops that. But the law does not require that um, doctors, uh, you know, 
hospitals, clinics provide basic medical treatment to the baby. So what they can do is just set the baby aside and let the child die. And that is what they do, in fact, do, and now can continue doing. It's also worth noting that um, Democrats blocked a bill yesterday also that would have, uh, that would have uh, outlawed abortion after 20 weeks gestation. Babies at that point can feel pain. At 22 weeks, they can survive outside the womb. Now, of course, nobody's surprised by that move. We, we knew that they would, they would block that bill, but it underscores the point that the Democrat Party at this point is nothing more than a whore of the abortion industry. That's what it is. It is morally corrupted and evil to its core. It is an enemy of life and of dignity. And if you are a decent person, you just cannot associate yourself with it. You, you can't be a Democrat. You can't vote for Democrats if you're a decent person who cares about human life and dignity. I'm not saying you have to be a Republican. Not at all. It's just but you can't be a Democrat, though. All right. Um, now, for today's daily cancellation, it is my great pleasure, in fact, to cancel The New Yorker. Um, the New Yorker today posted a cartoon on Twitter that is leading to me now canceling The New Yorker. Um, and when I say cancel, I don't mean canceling my own subscription. I don't have a subscription. I'm, I'm saying that The New Yorker in general is canceled now by decree, by me. So take a look at this, uh, at this cartoon. If you're listening on iTunes, can't see it. It's, uh, it's a four-panel comic. The first panel shows a guy in the wilderness, and he says, oh, no, it's getting cold and dark. In the next panel, he sees another guy, Mark Zuckerberg, and he says, thank God, another hiker, hiker Mark Zuckerberg, can you help? I'm lost. And then Zuckerberg says, okay. And then Zuckerberg says, here are a few options. One of them is accurate. The others could be misinformation. I'll let you decide. And then in the final panel, you see his helicopter, Zuckerberg's helicopter in the background, and he says, well, this is me. Bye. Which that part's kind of funny, and then I guess he leaves the guy, <laughs> leaves the guy in the, in the wilderness, as he as he uh, goes away in his helicopter. Now the point here is rather rather obvious. Uh, this is a criticism of Facebook's refusal to do fact checks uh, on political ads and on um, other content, uh, and 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 their refusal to to disallow the content that is not, in their opinion, truthful. The left thinks that Facebook should be performing this kind of fact-checking function on the content, mainly because the left hopes and assumes that if Facebook does fact-checks, all of the right-wing content, all the pro-Trump Trump content, all that stuff will summarily be banned because all of that is false, they think. So in this analogy, we, the helpless social media consumer, the average Facebook user, we are like wanderers in a cold wilderness, fearful, lost, Darkness is closing in, and uh, my, my, Mark Zuckerberg is the, is the guide who can show us the way uh, into the light and the warmth. And um, that is apparently how the New Yorker sees our relationship to billionaire tech moguls, which is very interesting. They, they, they see the billionaire tech mogul as, this, as this, this guide in the wilderness that can save our lives. We, we must cling to them. Show me the way, Mark Zuckerberg. That's how they see them, yet they, they hate billionaires. They think billionaires are evil. But they also want billionaires to decide what's true and not true and to moderate our access to content according to their, the billionaires, opinions about what's true and not true. So they hate billionaires, but they also see billionaires as the only ones who can rescue us from certain death in the forest of, of confusion. Now, this is all nonsensical, of course. It is not Facebook's job to decide what content is true. It's not their job to evaluate political ads or political content for its adherence to the truth. Why would you trust Facebook with that task? Why would you trust Facebook any more than you would trust whoever created the content to begin with? I'm not saying you should automatically trust either one. You shouldn't. That's the point. Yes, you should make up your own mind. So in this case, in this particular wilderness of the internet, uh, yeah, you should be given options and you can make up your own mind. Uh, you, you shouldn't want the billionaire in the helicopter to rescue you and make it easy. Um, in fact, when it comes to deciphering this stuff uh, you, you know, and, and deciding what's true and not true, it, it is better for the hiker to make up his own mind. 
because the other option is to trust Mark Zuckerberg blindly and to go where he, wherever he points. And that would be foolish. So this is a very dumb cartoon. And a very, uh, not just a dumb point, but one that contradicts what we normally hear from places like The New Yorker. And that is why The New Yorker is now canceled. All right. Um, got a bunch of email also. I think we'll save uh, this email for tomorrow. So people chiming in on the issue of, uh, of student loans, challenging my position uh, that I expressed yesterday, which is that in, 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 you know, w- when looking for the villains in the story of the student debt crisis, I think one of the primary villains are the employers who uh, have created, in many ways, this artificial need for degrees. And anyway, a lot of people disagree with me on that, and uh, I'll read those emails tomorrow. Matt Walsh Show at gmail.com. Matt Walsh Show at gmail.com. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Church of Cowards in stores now. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring, supervising producer Mathis Glover, supervising producer Robert Sterling, technical producer Austin Stevens, editor Danny D'Amico, audio mixer Robin Fenderson. The Matt Walsh Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey, everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven.